Welcome to this fireside chat. No fireside, though the weather definitely uh, allows for firesides by now. I'm Valentina. Thank you very much. I'm Empress of Product here at Klaus. And to start off, why don't you present yourself? Who are you? What is your role at Teleperformance? Absolutely. So uh, my name is Ahmad Baidun. Uh, currently, I'm an operation manager at Teleperformance. My, uh, my journey at Teleperformance started like 11 years ago. Oh, wow. That sounds like quite a long time, right? So I started as level one technical support specialist. So mm -hmm. from these normal agents that they begin, Uh, taking calls and all this type of stuff. But, uh, you know, from the very first moment when I started training, I just fell in love in what we do, customer service, you know, assisting customers, uh, communication skills and all this type of fancy stuff. And again, I, I grew in this, in this business. I took multiple positions within operations, mainly supervisor and so on and team lead. Um, but quality was my main, let's say, uh, skill. Mm -hmm. So also, I grew up after in that particular position, I took um, as a quality coordinator or what's considered like a system manager mm -hmm. uh, until I continued operationally and I became operation manager. So currently, I lead an account for 500 plus employees mm -hmm. um, and I am in uh, Greece subsidiary. So Teleperformance is a omnichannel uh, company. We have more than 330,000 people uh, oh, around the world. Wow. So we are talking about exactly. So uh, we are spread uh, in 80 countries. We have around 430 uh, contact centers in the world. And uh, I am in the Greek subsidiary, so uh -huh. in Athens. Oh, wow. You really made support your career. That is amazing. <laughs> I, think, I think really the, what, uh, the, the special here is that I have that mixture between operations and quality. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really one of the key success in my uh, professional career because I was always utilizing that mixture mm -hmm. that was, it, it helps pretty much in every way. Mm -mm. So uh, I have a qu couple of questions from the BPO perspective and then some for the, from the customer of a BPO perspective. So let's sure. start off with the BPO questions. What tips and tricks can you share with someone in a call center looking to set up a quality assessment program? Like what has worked and maybe what hasn't worked from the things that yeah. you have tried in the past? All right. So first, we need to really take into consideration what do they want to achieve. And normally, it is always shaped or influenced with what kind of clients you have as well. Hmm. So normally, your clients, they come up with certain agreements and they target specific, specific qualitative KPIs. So first, you need to understand what they are talking about, right? And um, what a contact center or a call center need to do is obviously to set up some sort of framework, uh, a quality framework where it consists of building your quality personnel that will be leading um, the team of uh, analysts, let's say, or any people that will be taking over that monitoring aspect to do the evaluation, the assessment, building up the reporting in order for you eventually to be achieving your, your KPI targets. Hmm. So uh, the tips mainly is first know your KPIs, mm -hmm. right? Know your agreement. It goes with a, with a statement of work with your client. So what do they want, right? And um, after knowing what they want, then establish the transaction monitoring form, which means you want to evaluate the transactions and that's where everything starts. Mm -hmm. You want to make monitors, you make to make, to make evaluation. So building that monitoring form with set of attributes, these attributes, tip number one, has to be calibrated with a client. Mm -hmm. So one of the common, common mistakes, you know, small contact centers or anyone come and say, okay, we're gonna have a sheet, we're gonna start evaluation and start sharing results. All right, based on what? Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that these attributes, in fact, will matter for your client, right? Mm -hmm. Are you touching upon important uh, checkpoints, important attributes? Uh, does it have any kind of criticality to your customers or to your business or even legal? with mm -hmm. compliances and so on. Uh, and every single attribute has to be calibrated to make sure you are seeing things the way your client is seeing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is step number one. When a monitoring form is created, it has to be calibrated. Mm -hmm. And it's not really enough to be calibrated with a client. It has to be calibrated also internally mm -hmm. because depending on how many personnel are responsible of doing the evaluation, also you want to make sure that your team is seeing it the same way. Mm -hmm. And we know very well that we tend to have often 
calibration sessions in order to sort out these gray areas. So that's really the start point. And then it goes under how, what is the frequency of monitors? Like how many you want to, to do per person? Do you want to monitor all the calls? Can you, in fact, monitor all the calls or chats or email or so on? So normally you go with a particular sampling mm -hmm. that will be representative with high level of confidence, low margin of error. Mm -hmm. That's a tip number two. Margin of error should be a terminology that they should feel very much comfortable with because it's not really enough just to monitor a set of uh, transactions. Mm -hmm. it, has to have a, a, uh, it has to be representative and reliable sampling. So that part needs always to be taken into consideration. And all of this should be translated into how many people I need. Like, okay, I'm, I'm making like hundreds of evaluations. Okay, how many, per how many hours I'm spending? So one person can do it or I need more people. So that's where you build up your uh, quality team. And after that, you need to set some sort of, of goals. All right, what is my aim? I'm only doing evaluation. I'm sharing feedback. And then what? So that's, that's where my role stops as a Q QA. No, it doesn't really because the quality people are engine that feeds in all supportive department. So it's, it feeds in training. It feeds in HR. It feeds in pretty much everything. And of course, operation because they are the best friends. Mm -hmm. So... Um, when it comes to, to, to that part, extra deep dive, right, always needs to be done in order to be touching upon what is my common driver, and that's a big topic. So mm -hmm. top contact driver is another tip that we give. It has to be tracked, it has to be traced, mm -hmm. it has to be measured, and you need to understand out of all the scenarios or all the kind of cases you are receiving, what matters the most? What are the common ones that comes? Because when you want to start doing particular focus, it has to come on that particular area. Maybe we can talk about it a bit, little bit more because the, the top contact driver by itself is, is a big topic and it's so important because it shapes pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. So after doing all these reporting, passing the feedback to all, all operations, right? Uh, then you will start to understand, am I meeting my target? Yes or no? And how and why I'm meeting my target is very important if I'm meeting it to know what I'm doing well, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just to take it for granted. Yeah, let's keep whatever we do, guys. It's not really a, a secret recipe. Uh, they need to know what is working and what is not working and eventually deep dive to apply the, the corrective action plans. So it is actually an ongoing process. This is not something like, okay, and once you've set it up, that's it. No, you have to like constantly it's monitor. It's very dynamic. Exactly. It's very, very dynamic. It's, it's very much alive and uh, it's never one-sided uh, type of thing. It, mm -hmm. uh, as we say, it, it takes two to tango. So a, yeah. a, the constant, constant communication with the client that we are discovering things and we have to understand, does it make sense from your end? So because they always have a better view on things mm -hmm. where they would be able to, uh, you know, shed more light on it. Mm -hmm. And how you then, do you then bridge the gap between the quality assurance work and the individual agents? Like, do you, um, do you from operations do trainings? Do you have one-on-ones? Are there team leads that intervene? Like, how do you make sure that what you find out actually then gets implemented at the, at the ground level, basically? That's another tip as well that we can talk about. So there is some sort of understanding that the QA personnel or the QA team is supposed to be away let's say, not really involved in operations. They make monitors, people that are isolated. They don't know the people, just make monitors and they pass feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Now here, I'm talking obviously from my personal experience. This is not really a setup that uh, from my side, I recommend because they need to be very much, in fact, involved in operation. They need to be even sitting with them. We're going to talk about the working from home situation, <laughs> right? But assuming that we're in a brick and mortar situation, they need to be really close to the people, understand the environment, learning from them as well, so that their feedback is in fact more realistic and closer to reality. So how we pass the feedback? The feedback is really passed to, to the agents at, uh, from different, uh, different, let's say, sides. One, through direct reporting from their supervisors, Mm -hmm. where they have their statistics of the previous day or for the week. So this is something, again, sent on a regular basis that covers the daily, weekly, monthly, and even quarterly, what matters as well to understand and monitor the progress. But whenever a monitor is being submitted, which means someone receives an evaluation, depending on the setup that exists from our side, for example, we have automatic notification that appears on the profile of the agent where they go there, they read, 
the commentary they did, what kind of notes they got, and the coaching comments. And if this particular transaction, for example, was a fail, that's where a one-on-one -on -one coaching session is uh, triggered and arranged mm -hmm. so that they discuss about that particular incident. And again, this is never a one-sided discussion because also agents, sometimes they have a point, right? And we need to understand from, from their view. So uh, from my side, I do accept and I do allow some sort of even correction in case the QA missed a particular point. Mm -hmm. That's how we can, in fact, uh, empower ourselves with, with more scenarios that will allow us to make a better, uh, accurate evaluation. Mm -hmm. So uh, agents are having their statistics and they have, again, direct access to it so that they understand how they are moving. Mm -hmm. Whether positive trend, negative trend, do we have a risk, uh, right? Is there something else needs to be done? But uh, like uh, um, refresh trainings, you know, and this type of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, from, from a data perspective, it's so important for them to know uh, their scores. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's, you have like a two-sided approach. On one side, the agents can like themselves go in and look like so if somebody is like i really want to improve they can actually if they have the motivation they can go in and look at they exactly can, what they need to do and on the flip side if somebody needs improvement and this is objectively necessary you can go in and like trigger that uh, exactly training. exactly we, we we do it um so it they have pretty much all type of access that will allow them to to understand where they stand right mm -hmm. where, where where am i mm -hmm. yeah so how did the, the COVID, you just mentioned that basically they should sit together, which currently is not a thing. How, yeah. how did you adapt to that? Oh, God. That's obviously one of the main current challenges right now that is running across our industry. Because what we do in reality, that might take us like 10 minutes to do it. Right now, in order to arrange for that, it takes obviously much more time. Hmm. So um, from, from, data pers from reporting perspective or from visibility that we are giving to our people, I don't think it changed much hmm. because whatever they were receiving, they still receive. Yeah. But the level of effort that the management has to put in order to make the communication pass a specific message and the coaching session mm -hmm. right now has to be arranged differently. Before, mm -hmm. it was so easy just to move on do a side-by-side, -side, do some, side of, some sort of uh, spot checks mm -hmm. to see what they are doing and also to understand from tool usage, in fact, like, okay, are they following the steps that we have agreed on mm -hmm. or no, we'd still have some other issues. Right now, they are at home, right? All what we see is that particular transaction that we're monitoring, their scores, but we're not able to monitor some behavior-related aspects that also plays a role. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I can say that right now we're taking more time from some, more side from our side as management, more mm -hmm. effort for something that we used to do with a shorter time frame. Yeah. That's one of the main main challenges. Do you think this will this is just a growing pain or changing pain? And once you have created new processes, this will taper out, or are you looking forward to getting back into the office and going back to where you were? Well, uh, there is a conflicting here feedback. Like when we uh, tend to, to get the feedback voice of our employees from time to time, uh, we do have some sort of split. Some of them are very much comfortable by staying at home. Some others, they want to return like just tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, from our side, we take it as, all right, assuming this will be the norm, because again, no one knows for how long this will stay. Yeah. Assuming that will be the norm, what kind of adjustments we have to do? And we have taken obviously several changes, whether from processes from, uh, mm -hmm. from our side, uh, so that at least we accommodate the particular situation. Uh, while the tackling aspect in terms of reporting, deep diving, um, building analysis, because right now where we are spending so much time is to understand from a learning curve perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So from the people that were working uh, on a brick and mortar situation, they used to have, for example, one month or two months as a learning curve. Right now, as we moved on, on working from home, um, how long is it taking them in order to start meeting their targets? Mm -hmm. And all of this, these things are factored in our analysis to understand, okay, if I have a new hired group right now, what kind of potential impact in my KPIs will happen and by mm -hmm. when? So that I prepare my client or I prepare some set of actions, in fact, to mitigate and to, to keep this impact at a minimum level. Uh -huh. So this is really triggering um, lots of uh, different, let's say, Definitely brainstorming sessions, quite mm -hmm. lots of them with our QA team 
and uh, taking the feedback with operations to understand, okay, guys, what are we observing in terms of changes mm -hmm. and uh, what we want to, uh, to recommend? The training, obviously, right now is happening again uh, from home. Yeah. Um, so also that part creates some sort of challenges, things that you could do quicker, role play scenarios, activities, and this type of things. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have to. We are changing our approach so that we cover different type of activities mm -hmm. within a work from home environment. But that that is super fascinating because you are now able to figure out what things were passed on by osmosis, so to say, and how can we actually put this into KPIs so that we don't depend on this kind of proximity. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. And as we mentioned, since our environment is already so dynamic, so mm -hmm. apart from this type of situations like a pandemic or whatever we want to call it, uh, we have to adapt and we have to adapt fast, right? Because the business of our client is moving mm -hmm. depending on what business we're talking about, be it a product related, so technical support, they are selling more, they're not selling, right? Mm -hmm. So we, from our side, we always have to adjust uh, from process perspective and from fle that flexibility, the agility as well in our work, Uh, is always number one. Mm -mm. It's not easy, right? It requires lots of effort. So I can tell how much my team is really uh, spending in order to do the, the right thing. And again, uh, looking into the outcome of this work, because sometimes we might implement some sort of actions, but the outcome is too small. So mm -hmm. that means we need really to make some, some adjustments there. Uh Well, in the long run, you will probably thrive from this, mostly because if you can manage to uh, do learning from home for one office, that also means you can spread knowledge so much quicker between offices. Because if you don't rely on physical presence anymore in one location, that means that suddenly everybody is in the same boat. And you can That's correct. And, like, spread the knowledge across all. That's correct. And uh, overall, we are pretty much famous with, uh, with sharing best practices. Mm -hmm. So whenever we see a good practice somewhere, Uh, we are pretty good in communicating it so that we mm -hmm. learn from it and not to fall again in the same road so that we are faster in, mm -hmm. uh, in results. Let's imagine I'm a customer and I'm looking for a BPO. What, but quality is like very, very high on my to-do list All right. so, or, or on my value list. So what tips and tricks would you recommend to somebody who is looking for a BPO? What should they look for? How can they find the right BPO for them? Uh, so we will always here start... Um, in terms of what KPIs you want to tackle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some people or some clients, they tackle the CSAT and the CSAT is still pretty famous uh, KPI and yeah. widely spread and exist. Uh, we have the NPS whenever we have product related. So to, to, to check the likelihood of promoting the product, mm -hmm. uh, we have, which is again, a more challenging KPI when it comes to the NPS because you can make the customer satisfied, but not to, uh, to, to a level to, to recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, And then you have the, the customer effort score. Uh -huh. So you know, to provide an effortless customer experience and so on. And then it goes the other, let's say, triggers or, or CSAT drivers, such as first contact resolution, issue resolution, mm -hmm. right? And this type of, uh, of things. And actually so the, the NPS and the CES are completely outside of your scope. Well, uh, there is nothing in our industry, industry considered out of our scope. We always try to see what we can do to influence, right? Okay. And, and by the way, this is also the mindset of our clients. So, all right, assuming it's an out of scope, but still what your agents can do mm -hmm. to turn around the experience. So mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the most challenging aspects. But uh, depending on the KPI that they are, uh, they are sharing, then we try to, to understand, okay, you have these targets, you have these KPIs, what kind of processes and what, your, what the tools are offering. Uh, when our clients comes with a particular KPI, sometimes the discussion right, does not really bring any kind of convincing because if they want a particular KPI, it means they want this particular KPI. Yeah. right? And mm -hmm. if they want a specific target, it means we're going to work with that specific target. Mm -hmm. Now, on the go, we try to understand if this target is really achievable mm -hmm. and we start looking into, into the data. Now, from our side, we always present our framework Because we do have a structure that consists of having a quality personnel that will be responsible of monitoring specific languages, mm -hmm. depending on which markets are more, uh, let's say, risky or tricky for them, more important, mm -hmm. right? That's where we make sure that we are covering the monitoring part with, uh, with the best uh, coverage possible. And the smaller ones, there are different workarounds like having sh smaller monitoring, let's say, volume that can be done uh, out there. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, what we provide is 
that framework that we have with the, with the tools and the processes that exist, because we have also developed our own tools mm -hmm. that will allow to do our analysis or monitoring with pretty much a quick time frame. So instead of spending time on Excels and you know this type of analysis and taking time, no, we have we have developed some sort of portals, you know, that it will do pretty much all these things uh, automatically. Um, but we do get in a discussion with our client to advise them that all right, that's what you want. In order to make this happen, what need to be done is one to three, like doing this set of monitors. We need this type of capacity for our QA that will be watching over your KPIs mm -hmm. and the expectations, right, will be set as such. Mm -hmm. uh, but the quality discussion at the very beginning, it will really consist of building the team rather than discussing the KPIs itself. And of course, looking into what kind of data we're going to get. Like, mm -hmm. am I able to really analyze all what you are, you, you, all the transactions? Do we mm -hmm. have enough visibility? Because in contact center, right, in our industry, we love data. We live from data. If we yeah. don't have it, we cannot really do many things. Yeah, because so you're flying if, blind. Exactly, exactly. And that also, as we, we go on, on working from home environment, by the way, uh, because obviously there are lots of business and many clients that due to, to privacy and uh, you know, security restrictions, uh, we do have now different type of views, restricted, let's say, views that do not really allow us to do the same analysis we used to do. Mm, and that adds yeah. an extra, extra challenge. So now, if you are giving me like a view only mode, then what I can do will be pretty much limited. Mm -hmm. I can though, I do have the expertise to deep dive, but you need to give me data. So mm -hmm. that's normally what we ask for. If you wanna ask for something, be generous with us mm -hmm. in, in data, and then you can expect anything from us. So basically it starts off almost like a consulting, like that you help the customer understand what is actually yeah. possible. We go, we go really in, in a uh, open discussion with high transparency because at the end of the day, we are building partnership. Mm -hmm. So we want obviously to be successful in uh, handling their business and we want to achieve our KPIs, but we also want to know, are these KPIs in fact can be achieved with these targets? Mm -hmm. So are these targets were coming based on statistics, right? Was there any kind of Six Sigma analysis that happened there? Mm -hmm. Because this is part of the expertise as well that we do. Uh, you know, with regression analysis, with CPKs and stuff. So we do understand the likelihood of meeting this target. Mm -hmm. And uh, if yes, then clearly it is a safe environment and you, we can start. If not, we can obviously discover it on the go. And this is where we provide our recommendations. Mm -hmm. And if the customer already has an in-house support team, because I think very often they have an in-house support team, then they realize we can't handle everything that is being thrown at us. Let's get help from outside. Let's How do outsource you... it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. How do you make sure, or what can the customer actually do to help you to get your team to the standard that they in, um, expect in-house? Like, do you, can they share trainings with you? Like, how do you make sure that there is basically an inter-team calibration happening? So, uh, and uh, plenty of, of clients also they do have. And in fact, we do uh, use this type of setup in order to benchmark, right, the, the overall work and to understand, okay, we have their work, their evaluation, their scores, and so on. And mm -hmm. then we start comparing with ourselves. So in order to meet and to be at the same level, right, this is where calibration happens. And of course, training. So before we start absolutely anything, there is always a training that has to be, um, to, 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 we have to begin with so that we prepare our people to what they need to start to do in operations. Mm -hmm. So whether this training is provided through our client, which means they do have the expertise they share with us, mm -hmm. or we utilize our expertise customized based on our client's priority. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, you know, again, it's an open discussion to understand um, what we need to deliver and up mm -hmm. to which level. But when such setup exists, there is always an ongoing discussion where we calibrate, we share unique scenarios because we always meet some edge cases, no matter how you define it, there are always edge cases. And uh, that's where we, we come up with a conclusion. So when such setup exists, it's very, very helpful. When it doesn't, it will come mainly from us while we communicate with the, the, the vendor manager, for example examples mm -hmm. so that we discuss about our findings hmm. so which brings me to the next question is there a circumstance where somebody somebody should not use a, a bpo because i suppose it's very easy to wait too long 
but you don't want to outsource too early either. So it's like a balancing act. Well, I think it's pretty important first um, before outsourcing to be running for a certain period of time. Now, this is more into project, you know, project managing aspect, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I will give my point of view on this one. Uh, it's always healthy to be running in-house for a certain period of time because when the time comes to enter in a discussion with a contact center, a contact center, normally we know better than anyone else about what customer service is about because mm -hmm. that's what we do. Experience. Right? <laughs> that's what we do, right? That's our that's our core core business. So uh, we will be very much demanding and asking things that are so detailed that if you don't practice it yourself, it will oh, be very difficult to, 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 yeah. to, to catch. So that includes IT, that includes uh, tooling, that includes uh, HR, job profile, right? Job description, what kind of expectations, what we need to hire, right? Mm -hmm. um, it includes certain bandwidth, uh, capacity, um, the training curriculum itself that you have, does it exist or it doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. So um, the arrival pattern, like what kind of calls are we expecting to receive and where we have the peak hours, when we have the less peak hours, mm -hmm. right? So there are lots of details that from our side, we're gonna ask by default, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of coming to a contact center to start such relationship, while we, you do not have enough information to provide, it doesn't mean that you cannot really start it. You can still, but you will, we will begin pretty much on the blind. Like we will be starting from the very, very basic mm -hmm. where we cannot advise. We cannot put the added value from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, that's what you have. That's fine. That's what we can provide in terms of tools, expertise, and so on. Let's begin and we will discover things on the go. Mm -hmm. So instead of discovering things on the go, which of course it will bring some sort of negative aspects where you, mm. you get some, some sort of errors, mistakes, outages, downtimes, and so on, uh -huh. right? If it is already running for a period of time in-house, uh, then you will be better prepared. So basically, if somebody cannot answer your questions for detail yet, they need to first figure out their it own. Means, <laughs> it, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but this is, this is not really a showstopper because it depends. If they want to outsource, okay, let it outsource because yeah. maybe they simply don't want to, to invest on it maybe mm -hmm. and they, or they prefer simply just to give it to, to the experts in this field mm -hmm. and that's also fine. In, I'm originally from Germany, so I went to went, went to uni university in Germany as well. And I think every single student that I know at some point had, has worked in a contact center to make some money while they are going to university. Sure. And you, usually those were because you didn't need any other skills than being friendly on the telephone. And then like you would get taught exactly what you had to say. And that's it. And it was like very low paying, low skill jobs. And the turnover was super high. So like, yeah. I think I lasted like four weeks, maybe. Oh. But, and I know that, uh, and of course, like from a business point of view, it's like you have to train new people all the time because the, they are in circumstances in their lives where maybe they're just looking for something for three months over the summer, which happens here in Barcelona quite a, quite a bit. Yeah. Or yeah. like, so how do you handle that when you really have to constantly retraining new people? That's a very, very, very good question. And in fact, the turnover, uh, when, when it comes to attrition, that's what we call it, right? Mm. So when we lose people and we have to replace, uh, it's one of the enemy of our business because we develop, we spend, we invest on training and so on. And out of the sudden, we lose people. So this is where we have a long set of analysis to understand from where this is coming from. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons that happens, in fact, is uh, how much of attention we are paying to our, our uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, are we really providing them with the right level of knowledge that will allow them to feel comfortable in what they are doing, mm -hmm. right? So this is where the start point comes from hiring, right? Mm -hmm. So from the very first moment, when we hire someone for a particular position and we have certain requirements, what we do is, or what needs to happen, in fact, is to have a really clear... A job description uh -huh. with a specific skill set mm -hmm. and our human resources are supposed really to bring us based on these job description mm -hmm. now assuming in most cases sometimes you do not really find with all the qualifications so you need to train the skill and yeah. this is also known factor in our industry mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. that, okay, we can train the skill. Now, the training uh, has to ensure that you are providing a good set of knowledge before joining production. Mm-hmm. And we are very much realistic. And this is something I used to tell my my employees as they start you know, and try to always meet them in the very first day to set expectations. Mm-hmm. And I always tend to ask them, guys, by the end of training, when do you expect yourself to be at which level of readiness, mm-hmm. right? And I used to get, you know, common answers like, I will be super ready. I will be like 100%, 110%. I will be all there. And then I tell them, guys, if you come out from this training with 50% of readiness, we will be happy, right? Mm-hmm. Because they will get the basics, right? Mm-hmm. They will be learning lots of things, but on the go, they will also forget. And mm-hmm. we know this, uh, but the basics are supposed to be covered. And after training, this is where the role of QA people and operation to make sure that we are retaining the guys. How we retain mm-hmm. the guys? Um, we know very well that whenever we have someone not meeting the target, we do coaching sessions and we try again to monitor, evaluate, and to keep a close eye and so on, mm-hmm. right? If we do it wrong, we lose the guys. So how, what does it mean if we do it wrong? If someone is not meeting the target, has to be coached. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be wrong if we are doing, first of all, wrong targeting of our outliers. Mm-hmm. Because not everyone that is not meeting a target is an outlier. So w- this is where the top contact driver, by the way, comes in. So are we coaching or are we selecting our outliers based on the common drivers that we are facing, mm-hmm. or these people are outliers because this particular driver that they are not receiving good CSAT comes once per per a month, right? Mm-hmm. Or okay. once per, per couple of weeks. So we need to be very much di- uh, targeting, first of all, the top contact driver, looking into the outliers underneath these drivers, mm-hmm. right? And to not to focus on all the people because there is no way for our bandwidth to put a good coaching session with high quality for if we everyone. focus on, on yeah. exactly because especially during the startup all your team might be outliers yeah. so <laughs> we, we don't want really to, to be coaching everyone and it will be just a matter of quick session no mm-hmm. so we target the ones that are really causing impact which means they have high sample size and high influence to the overall score mm-hmm. right so these are the people that we want to target first so yeah. that's where we start coaching them whether from the QA people, and I am from the people that recommend the QA personnel to be involved in coaching. Mm-hmm. This is not uh, some, some other schools that say they do not. Mm-hmm. They prefer only operations. It really depends. But uh, from my side, it's pretty much recommended. Mm-hmm. And um, after we do the coaching, this is where we start observing the progress. Do we have improvement? Mm-hmm. Even if it was slight improvement, that's not a problem. But we always set smart target, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't tell them, guys, right now you are on a C-set of 60%. I expect you to be 90% in the next two days. Yeah. That's not going to happen, <laughs> right? It's not going to happen. So we need to make it feasible to them and to mm-hmm. set some sort of time frame and not to put many actions. And that's also another really mistake uh, when someone makes a coaching session that they make a transaction monitoring and they see that this person failed in like 10 out of 15 uh, attributes. Mm-hmm. And they start coaching across all these 10. All of them. Yeah. And, and they put action plan on all these 10. It's not going to happen. No. So we need to always select the top three, if mm-hmm. maybe even top two, right? The most important ones that matters, that are correlated. That's why the analysis are important to understand mm-hmm. which attributes will really lead to in, uh, improvement on CSAT or NPS and so on. And that's how we start monitoring the progress. Mm-hmm. So top contact driver as uh, analysis should always be from the top one priority, but mm-hmm. you will not be able to, to do it from the very first, uh, let's say very first day. You will have to wait so that you collect some sort of historical data. Mm-hmm. That, that is super fascinating because it basically means that the way you coach agents is the same way that you choose which tickets or which conversations to monitor because you will always want to go to which is the highest impact category that you want to review, but also that you want to coach on. Because yeah. like so the, in the aggregate, yeah. it's where the change happens. That's correct. So what we do, we monitor on two aspects. When it comes to coaching based on a, a root cause analysis, mm-hmm. yes, we target the top contact driver. When we want, when we want to, to make a remote monitoring for our people, mm-hmm. we select random uh, interactions, right? So that we do not bias the result. No, we want to, to check randomly what's going on. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But the root cause analysis based on, based on the survey, that's where, you, where we go with a targeted approach because our aim is to improve results. I don't, yeah. I no longer want just to see what's going on in general. No, hmm. I want to make improvement right now. So I have mm-hmm. to be very specific. Yeah, specificity in coaching is super important. And yeah. repetition. Like if you can actually make the changes into a habit, then you have basically won. Exactly. And Valentina, you mentioned that the people just leave after a couple of weeks or a couple of months. That's because if we, we, show, we coach them all the time and we see that they're not making improvement, we make them feel that they are useless. Like yeah. I am not really, I'm not really suitable for this job. So mm-hmm. they simply go away. And that but is if, fine too. That is fine too. Of course, it exists, right? If it happens, it happens. Uh-huh. But at the same time, we don't really need only to coach the negative behavior. We also mm-hmm. need to pass and tap on the shoulder of the guys when they do something good. That's why positive coaching is so important in order to call out what they do well, right? So uh-huh. we have to see it in both eyes, yeah. not only from, from outlier perspective, uh-huh. because that's where they encourage each other that, oh, I did something well, and we call it out loud. Uh-huh. So when there is something positive, we call it out loud. That's another tip. When there is something, when there is something negative, it has to be on a discrete session. So mm-hmm. we don't go and coach in front of everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's going to be very demotivating. The public shaming, no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, okay. uh, yeah. so basically, cr- criticism in private and recognition in public. So that that exactly. person both feels like personally recognized, but also can be a little bit like an example for everybody else where they can aspire to. Exactly. So this is what I really encourage, the po- spreading the positive vibe. If there's something negative, Take it in the office. Take it on, on any discrete session. Mm-hmm. But the positive vibe is so important, right? Do so you do the shout outs in remote? Do you have like a Slack channel or, or team channel or something? Like that's, that's that? a, again, that's a, a very good question as well. So what we do from time to time, we do some sort of town hall meetings, uh, like on web conferencing calls, uh, whether we meet early in the morning. Uh, and I try also myself to be in these sessions, mm-hmm. even though we do have, again, plenty of people, lots of things. But it's very important also to hear from the manager of the account, like is calling out the name himself, mm-hmm. right, or themselves, uh, which means they do know what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. We as individuals, we matter to the business. Yes, mm-hmm. you are part of the family, right? Um, and at the end of the day, they are on the front line with customers. So it is in our um, interest to make sure that those guys are so motivated. So mm-hmm. yes, we do this type of meetings. Uh, or whether on a kind of, of huddle meetings or stand-ups. So also we take the chance. And of course, the traditional way of communication, which we know very well in uh, calling out something good is not so uh, maybe recommended, but again, emails sometimes, some people appreciate it coming from, from their manager or the team lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, being called out loud again with all these fancy stuff, uh, it makes the person pretty much proud. Mm-mm. Is there anything that you would like to, that I didn't ask or something that you'd like to mention that I have kind of, that you want to leave on the table before we finish this up? Yeah, what I want to say is um, providing the quality people with the right level of um, training, right? Mm -hmm. And the tools uh, clearly will make a difference. So here we talk, when we start talking about Six Sigma methodology, Mm -hmm. which means extra tooling that you are providing that allow them to do uh, histograms, allow them to do CPK analysis, uh, you know, the regression analysis. So all this type of fancy analysis that allows you to understand the business more, right? And allow you to evaluate your business from different uh, corners at the product level, at uh, uh, agent level, at uh, any particular driver level, right? That's where you start discovering things that will allow you to take different type of actions. Mm -hmm. Right. So apart from having outliers that can be identified under particular driver, if I am supporting specific products, uh, I want to see maybe this person is very good in all the rest of products, but only there's one particular product that, uh, you know, they're missing. Mm -hmm. So that's where we start arranging for uh, refresh trainings, Mm -hmm. right? Targeting specific scenarios that we have faced in order to start closing gaps and Mm -hmm. whatever action uh, has to be done it needs to be tracked after to check the outcome to mm-hmm. see, am I bringing improvement, right? And if yes, again, we call it out loud because it means it was a success story. And whatever we discover and we correct, it, how, it always has to be uh, fed into the training, right? Mm-hmm. Because in operation, we correct multiple things, right? We learn things and we, make, we apply actions. If we do not correct the initial setup of the training mm-hmm. from curriculum perspective, uh, from... Um, 
TCD perspective, which means the top contact driver, mm -hmm. the training has always to be customized based on top contact driver. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we discover some sort of specific skills that need to adjust the job description, again, we need to feed in HR. So mm -hmm. that's why the quality, again, is what we call the dynamo, right? Or the engine that feeds in yeah. pretty much everything. And uh, it has always to be in a constant development. Mm -hmm. So whatever development or investment goes on the quality team, it's not really a waste of money or waste of time. It is something that will, will save uh, business at a later stage. That is a beautiful ending. Thank you so much. That's amazing. <laughs>